Well, hi there, and welcome back to another episode of Let's Talk Real Estate Investing. I'm your host, Sharon Bornholt, and I'm so happy you're tuning in today. Today, my guest is Matt Cavanaugh, and we've tried to get the show done for a little bit, so I'm happy that we're doing it today. Matt is a true visionary, a strategist, a real estate investor, and he is the co-host of the Freedom Chas Chasers podcast, which I had the pleasure of being on a while back. He has a passion for helping people achieve freedom and live the lives they were meant to live. And what a great purpose in life. Matt is licensed and active as a re retail realtor in 10 states, selling hundreds of units per year. And he's a partner in a large scale wholesale operation, currently operational in 10 markets. Well, welcome to the show, Matt. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. And I just, I'm honored to be here and it was so great to have you on our show. So super excited. Well, well, I was happy to be on your show and we'll definitely link to that so that uh, folks can uh, hear that too. But, you know, you make the rest of us feel a little bit like a slacker. I see, <laughs> you know, li licensed <laughs> realtor in 10 states yeah. and a wholesale operation in 10 states. You know, the rest of the people are probably going, well, I thought I was doing pretty darn well. And now I don't know about that. <laughs> so why don't we tell people how you got started in real estate? Yeah, totally. And and just for the record too, we, we advanced to so many states so we could study the markets to determine which of the states we wanted to, to go deeper in. So we've actually scaled down to about five states now, which are the most profitable. So the number, in case anybody's struck by the number, is was just a, a part of an R and D research project. But how did we get into real estate? For me, I was a, a math teacher, uh, loved teaching. It, it would have been a career for me, but the income was not enough to provide for the family. So that led me to seek alternate options, and which led me to B two B sales, which that was my first foray into into selling. Really fell in love with the learning of how you know, human psychology works and how to help people come to a buying decision. And I would have done that most likely for my whole career if it wasn't for how much they limited the things that I could do for that business. Mm -hmm. I had all these ideas and visions, as you mentioned, visionary. And mm -hmm. I was shocked that some of my visions were met with more negativity than positivity. And so it got to a point after being there for three and a half years that I felt I, I've got to have an outlet, a channel to get these ideas I have into the into the world and see if they work. And so then I started to look at what what industries could I invest in as well as, you know, be a part of. And so real estate out of those industries seemed to make the most sense. And that's that's how we got into it. I can totally see how you would segue into that. And we talked a little bit before that we started the show about sales. This is something that most people, they don't like to, to sell. And they're quite frankly, not very good at it. They're not, they're not natural, uh, naturally talented at that. And let's face it though, no matter what business you're in, you're in the business of sales. You've got to figure this out. So um, today I need a crash course in sales, Matt. <laughs> I'm happy. I'm happy to go through it. <laughs> One of the things I want to talk about too, is they say that generally you understand if people have a natural talent for something by whether they can explain it or not. So for example, a person who has natural aptitude for something generally cannot tell you how to do it or explain it to you. They say, I don't know. I just do it. <laughs> so the fact that I hopefully can explain this today, if I can explain it well, you recognize that I did not have an aptitude for it in the way that most people would think. So hopefully just right out the gate, anybody listening to this can recognize if you want to be good at sales, but you don't feel like you're naturally good at sales, this is definitely for you. Because when I got hired on at my first sales job, my boss told me I was the worst like person he had ever hired as far as natural talent. <laughs> my voice cracked when, like not normally, but my voice cracked when I went into sales mode. Like everything that you don't want to happen, mm -hmm. happened. And so I had to build my knowledge from the ground up. The only thing that was really valuable for me at the beginning was I had to make a living because I was the only provider in my family. And I actually did love the, the learning process of the strategy. So I didn't love getting rejected. I didn't love having to call people and inconvenience them, but I loved the fact that there, I could put a system and a thought pattern to get better each day at, at doing that. And so that was really all I had to begin with. And every lesson that I learned and the framework that I've built has, has all been 
from that starting point. So just to encourage anybody who doesn't feel naturally gifted, don't let that stop you because sales is definitely a skill worth learning. So it's fair to say that anyone that has the desire could learn to be a good salesman? 100%. Now, now I'll say this. There's, there's, I would consider there to be about four main skills in business growth that are very, very valuable. Sales being a foundational skill, marketing, networking. You could even consider copywriting, which is kind of salesmanship and print. It's kind of the, the go-between between sales and marketing. And then the fourth would be networking. So for those that don't want to become good at sales, pick one of the other ones, pick networking, do what Sharon and I are doing right now, which is a great way of b- making business and, and building your network without having to do any selling at all. But for those of you that recognize the value of actually having that as a skill as well, it, it, you do not have to be good. It's, it's well, well worth it. So, um, but yeah, um, just to go in and start talking about some of the basics of it. So the fundamental thing about sales for me that made it something I could do long-term and sustain was the fact that I wasn't having to convince somebody to do anything they didn't want to do. That was my biggest concern is that I would have to get somebody to give me money or buy a product that wasn't in their best interest. To me, that would have been a, a non-starter. I, I don't want to be in unethical practices where we're persuading people for the wrong reasons. But once I recognized that sales was really just about getting in front of the right people, asking them the right questions to unlock what's important to them, and then if our product or service match what they needed, just saying, here it is, you know? And so it's, it was a lot more relational than I thought it would be. And a lot less like all the pressure tactics, in my opinion, people have to pressure people into sales because they don't know how to sell. Pressure is not the good thing in sales. It's actually the, it's the antithesis relationship development and, and asking the right questions is everything. If you do those well, the, the closing is just as simple as taking an order like you would at a restaurant. Hmm. That is so interesting. I know that you have to find out what people really need. You have to, your, obviously your product has to suit their needs, but I, so many people, they just cannot even convey. I've noticed this in the world. They cannot convey what their product even is. They try to tell you what it is they, they're selling and they can't communicate it themselves. Yeah, a hundred percent. And first and foremost, like I guess just general rule of thumb, one thing that people can take away is stop trying to describe what your product is and start trying to describe what it does for your client. Mm -hmm. What is the end result that your client gets if they use your product? Mm -hmm. Is it peace of mind? Is it a monetary return? Is it less work that they have to do? So what if you list all of the things that happen positively for your client, if they take on and buy your product, that is what you are selling. Mm-hmm. So you're, you're saying selling a transformation, you're selling a transformation. Exactly. You're not, you're not selling the fact that they're going to have to do 400 pushups every day and eat <laughs> less cake. You're selling that they're going to look amazing. And it's going to feel great. And they're going to be able to be more attractive to the opposite sex and feel more confident in all of those, of those benefits. So there are many types of different sales tactics in uh, real estate. One that that I I know that you excelled at were phone sales. Uh, That is for me, if somebody said, Sharon, I want you to cold call, I'm I'm not doing it. Nope, not doing that. So did you have qualified leads or did you tell me about the phone sales part about that? Because I know you did over a million dollars in in several different industries. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So when I was in B2B sales, it was, I always told myself, like a lot of people that I'm better in person than I am on the phones. Mm -hmm. And that, that was an unfortunate, uh, fault. It was not true. It was just, I had not developed the proper understanding of reading people without seeing them in person. Mm -hmm. And so it was, it was a quick skill to add. And so the, the value of being good on the phones versus in person is the amount of volume that you can do. And then I would say copywriters, the people that write sales landing pages, once you learn that skill, now, now you're on a whole nother level because now you don't even need the phones. You, you could sell somebody just with them reading or your landing page or watching your video. And so when I was selling door to door for B2B, it was, it was really tough because we make all these sales, but you're limited on time. Mm-hmm. So I I then realized I have to get good at the phones. So getting good at the phones allows me to five or 10 X the amount I can sell because I don't have to drive anywhere. 
And so then it became a game of studying, how can I understand how a person is thinking and feeling over the phone just as easily as I would if I could see their face? And so some of the things that came from that was just understanding how important the clues are when people give you certain words. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I love to study is psychological testing. Like you look at like the disc profile that people often reference. For me, the Enneagram is the gold standard of what I like to study for human psychology when it comes to sales, because that framework is not as much a behavioral pattern that's studied. It's more of a motivation framework. Mm -hmm. So it places people in nine different categories as to what's important to them. And so as I got deeper into that, it helped me to recognize that the words that people use are a tell to their values. Certain people value things being done correctly. Certain people value things being done quick. Certain people value easy. All people value each thing in a different quantity. But when you start using words that resonate with people's core fundamental values, it's the level of connection that's made quickly just is exponential. So how do you pull those words out of the people or do you just wait till they happen? Oh, they happen. They, 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 they give happen. them all away to you. Okay. They give them all away. And sometimes just because maybe someone uses a word, but it's not connected to a core value, you can reciprocate that word and then you could see how they respond. And so it's interesting that like people that are more, say, detail oriented and care about mm -hmm. things being right, will use the word correct more often when they respond. And, and so they, there's just clues. So as they're giving you clues, you're essentially mirroring or doing slight variations of mirroring so that you can have resonance in their words. So their speed that they speak at will typically tell you things about what they care about. And the words they use will tell you things about what they care about. And then there's the element of sometimes people will treat you one way at the beginning of a cold call, but that's not the real them. That's the defense then that's happening. And so the deeper that I went into study of that, the more you're, you know, you're able to quickly disarm their, their defensive self and then start to understand who they are. And then as you're pitching the product and, and asking them questions, you're able to do it in a way that resonates really, really deeply with them so that they feel the similarity between you is really high. And so it just increases the receptivity to your pitch by like a factor of 10 or 20. That's really, that's really important to understand. So this uh, obviously using human psychology will increase your effectiveness. Um, how does someone begin to learn about this? How do, wh where would they start? I think the easiest framework and the free framework. So I always like to start with easy and free so people can dip their toe in. It's like when you want to learn a new instrument, not usually advisable to go buy the $10,000 guitar on day mm -hmm. one. It's like, hey, start with a loaner guitar and then move your way up. So the, the easiest way and the thing you're going to have to do anyways is you're going to have to understand how you sound and what you say. So this is usually not a fun process for people, but it's the most valuable. It's, it's just recording your calls. When people hear their own voice, it doesn't matter how good it is. They usually freak out and think it's terrible. Mm -hmm. And so... When you go to make calls to somebody, just record them and then play them back to yourself. And then you can ask yourself a series of questions. Do I sound confident? Because confidence is like the number one trait that you need to have as a salesperson, no matter what. Like if you're not communicating a message that, mm -hmm. that this thing is worth it, that I know it's great, then your chances of selling are very, very low. So you're listening to your, your confidence level. You're listening to your tonality, making sure there's a smooth flow to your words that they're articulated clearly. And then after that, everything else is surrounding the concept of what is the prospect saying, what words, what tonality, and getting more in sync with the way that they're talking. Okay. So, so in many ways, when I work in the niche of probates, I look for visual clues from the people. So it's a similar type of thing, uh, visual and verbal clues. And I tell people, you'll know when they're ready to show you the house because you just do, but I couldn't explain to you exactly how you're going to know that moment, but that you know from the from their conversation, from the conversation you've had until that point when when it's time to take the next steps. What you're you describing is something that I call the magic moment. Oh, and the magic so moment? 
in sales, my my dad and several other mentors that that I had taught me about when you go into a sales process, the goal is to build relationship with somebody like 100%. And so you don't talk about business for the first segment of the relationship right. building process. Right. The, the prospect tells you when to talk about business. They do it by shifting in their seat. They doing it by changing the tonality of their voice. They'll shift their glasses. They, they will change their body or vo vocal position. They'll do something with their body that's shifting. Mm -hmm. And that is telling you psychologically, hey, I'm ready to move on to the next phase. Mm -hmm. And when that moment happens, then you know, okay, it's time. This is so important to understand because this is something that you're generally not taught. Uh, Correct. I, dis I discovered it just by kind of by accident, but that was my goal. That is my goal always is to go in and build rapport. That's the number one thing and let them talk about what they need to talk about and then move on to business. But that's so curious. Now I'm wondering what exactly happened or happens when that, when that moment comes. So the magic moment, that is so interesting. Yeah. And we're both, we both are saying the same thing. And it's so cool that you recognize that. Like, I just remember like being taught that by my mentors and like going like, like, is this real? And then like, then you start to see it, but to not have a mentor tell me that, like, and you found like, that's very powerful, very, very insightful of you. Yeah, because it, it's not an easy thing to recognize. And I think it takes practice. And, but folks listening to Matt talk about this, you've got an edge now, you know, you know, to look for these clues, because I don't think most of us um, even knew to look for the clues. Yeah, a hundred percent. And you could see the salesmen that do and the salesmen that don't, because if you don't look for those clues, you talk too long and then you create a, a level of discomfort. And so all of these processes are designed to make the prospect feel like a million dollars, you know, to be very, very comfortable so that they're willing to be as transparent with you as possible. So you have the info you need to give them what they want. So when you are, um, doing sales, you mentioned being confident. And that's a that's a big thing for real estate investors. I, if they think back to it, when everyone took their first few phone calls, they were pretty much ter terrified. They've, sent, they've spent the money, they've sent out the marketing, and now somebody actually called them. And I've had pe students tell me, I didn't answer the phone. <laughs> so that's the thing I always t tell them, make your mistakes on the phone, because when you meet with somebody face-to-face, -face, that's when you really got to have your act together. You know, if you're going to make a mistake, go ahead and make it, make, you have to, it's a, it's a practice, even, you know, talking to people on the phone, you can't get better at any of this if you don't practice it. But uh, I don't know anyone that hasn't made a million mistakes. It, looking back on it, you make the mistakes and then you move on, but that's how you learn to do this. 100%. And I'll say too, like you don't have to be perfect to make a sale. Like, in fact, there are a lot of people that are quite bad at doing this <laughs> and they make a lot of sales because of their activity. If you get good, it just increases the amount of sales you make per the amount that you work. And so like, just, just to give you an example, I trained my daughter over the last summer in making calls to, to real estate prospects. And she set six appointments in her first, it was like a week or two as a 12 year old. Wow. And I did that for her benefit. Cause I, I want her to have the four basic skills of networking, marketing sales so that she could do whatever she wants in life. Mm -hmm. But also I wanted to, to show the team that we were working with at the time. I said, like these excuses that you have, they're, they're BS. Like, like it's a joke. And so I took my 12 year old daughter over the course of one month and I gave her the script book, every objection. And she, she memorized it and we rehearsed it so that she could deliver it with confidence mm -hmm. and being 12, 12 years old and being female, like she has a higher pitch voice. Mm -hmm. So we did a couple exercises where she could drop her voice just a little bit, drop the air back in the back of her, you know, uh, vocal cords and drop it down a little bit. So she would sound maybe like 15. Mm -hmm. And so she was able to deliver. And so the cool thing about that was now you have all these 30 to 50 year old men that are like, okay, I, I really don't have an excuse um, because my daughter doesn't have the limiting beliefs that they did. Mm -hmm. Like, she's just like, okay, dad told me to do this. I'll do this. And so mm -hmm. I think, again, you, you don't have to be perfect, but it's, it's really just in the practice. And I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing how fast you can get good if you put your mind to it. Uh, did you, did you have books that you read or, uh, you know, were there resources or was it all hands-on learning for you? 
it was all the above, like mostly hands-on learning. It's really hard to read a book and understand. Mm -hmm. One of the, one of the things I like to do if, when I train salespeople is you need to go make about a thousand, 1500 calls with no books. Like, mm -hmm. so that when you read books, when you re have mentors, you can understand and grapple with, with what they're saying. It's really a, it's a, not a fun way to do it, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, it's worth it because if you get beat up a bunch and, and you're still resilient, then you're definitely going to make it. And so then it's just a matter of, of building those skills. But as far as books go, I have probably read almost every sales book that's ever been written. And I don't adopt the vast majority of what they say. I pull snippets. Mm -hmm. And I would say for people learning sales, focus more on the elements that drive relationship than, than tactics. The closing tactics, in my opinion, are far less valuable and are probably going to lead you down a path you don't want to go more than it's like, how do I have a deeper understanding of how humans work and giving them what they want? Like if you focus on, on serving others and just being confident within that frame, you'll, you'll end up with more results. And I think you'll really love how you feel about the process. Let's, okay. So let's talk a little bit about real estate specific. Uh, let, let's talk about someone trying to close a deal that's struggling to, uh, they they can maybe generate the leads. Maybe they're even good at networking. But when they're sitting face to face, Matt and I are sitting across from each other, and I want to close a deal with Matt. What are some things they could do, and what are they messing up in this process? So generally, when people think of sales, there's an immediate shift and move towards I need to persuade and convince mm -hmm. somebody of something. Completely the wrong frame of mind. Generally, when you're selling something to somebody, you want the frame of mind of, I want to know what they want, and I want to know how they want to get it and the way they want it, like the how, what, when, where, why. Mm -hmm. And then I want to find out how can I take everything they want, the how, what, when, where, why, and how can I still make that, get the outcome that I want. And then sometimes, and where the challenge comes in is where those two things aren't, they don't have overlap or their overlap is very, very small. Mm -hmm. And so that's where then you have to begin to move the needle. But when you want to change somebody's opinion on something, in my opinion, the best way, and sometimes the only way you can do it is by literally like having them pour out everything that they want. So they know that they are completely understood. And once they are understood, you have the foundation to be able to help shift their, their perspective. Their perspective. Uh, yeah. Changing, changing the outcome. It, it, it's a little bit more under your control than changing the seller's expectations. I like to call it that. Yes. And these skills are so valuable for things mm -hmm. other than real estate too. Like they're valuable when you're parenting, they're valuable in your relationship with your spouse and your friends. And, you know, they want something in life that's, that just doesn't fit for you. And it's like being able to move in a direction where you could find the win-win and you have to change mm -hmm. their paradigms on things. Knowing these skills can be very, very, very helpful. Yeah, this I can see where this is totally. I never really thought of it. it well, it is psychology, and I certainly knew it is. Um, I don't think we, a lot of us, actively put that into play in our businesses. And once you're aware that you can use this to your advantage and you learn about it, then you you kind of have an edge that maybe some other business people, some other investors don't have. It's, it's wild. And so there's deals that you get done that you would never have gotten done. And then there's deals that you would have gotten done, but you buy them $200,000 lower than you would have bought it if you didn't have those same skills. Mm -hmm. Because it's not just about closing the deal. It's about making people feel comfortable. And once they're comfortable, they'll tell you what's important to them. And often for a lot of the people you're going to buy deals from, price is not the most important thing to them. Mm -hmm but they don't want to tell you that they want to come out with, here's my price. But once you make them feel comfortable, you find out that like, like for one of the deals I bought, the guy was willing to sell it to me hundreds of thousands of dollars below market value because he's like, look, I'm, these are going to go to my druggy grandchildren who are going to blow the money. But because we like you guys, like this is what we want for it. And we know you're going to take care of the properties. You're going to increase their value. And that brings me more joy and value than giving an extra hundred or 200,000 to my, someone who's just going to blow it on drugs. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I've said that many times. It's not always about the price and it's your job as an investor to find out what they really want or need. And then 
you can add the psychology in there and hopefully that'll all happen a little bit faster in some cases. Now, Absolutely. I know that you have a business partner and um, I wanted to talk about how partnerships can help your business grow. And I like the fact that with partners, you, you hear all these horror uh, partner stories. And I know that you've built a very successful partnership that you all don't live, uh, you live in opposite parts of the country. But how have you all used that relationship to grow your business? Yeah, so I've ran some some businesses that have employees and I personally prefer partnerships over over employees. So it's not that we have zero people on our mm -hmm. payroll, but my preference is partnerships. Mm -hmm. So I think that is not like a statement of that's the best way to do it in the world. It's a statement of for my personality, that's what I enjoy. Mm -hmm. I find myself not to be a micromanager at all. It's like I am so far on the opposite side of that spectrum. I don't manage enough. And so given that that's my personality, partnerships are better because you're able to rely on the person to do what they're going to do. Now, I think picking your partners is important, how you pick them, structuring it in a way that protects both of you guys is really, really important. But for me, the thing that I love about partnerships is you're able to generally get a, a caliber of person you could never get in an employee. So generally your absolute top employees, if they're even willing to be employees at all, will only be so for so long before they go and start a competing business or they go into a completely different field and you lose them. And so seeing that cycle in my own businesses, it's like you'd have people that are good that you can get to, to decent um, and they would stay with you generally long-term or, or, or midterm, but then your real stellar players, they always want to keep leveling up. And there's a, a pervading like philosophy and I, I'm not even saying it's a bad philosophy, but like generally people don't want to work under somebody else, even if it's a good situation. Right. Because like, I, I want my be my own boss. Mm -hmm. And so one of the ways that you can let somebody be their own boss and you could still make as much money or more is by partnerships. It's like, OK, you know, don't be my employee. Let's partner on this deal. And mm -hmm. and so I think that's those were kind of the underlying thoughts that really made a difference for me is, hey, if I partner with people, I can go get great, great people that will work way more than 40 hours because they're driven by the ownership they have and the profits that they make. And so you end up working with somebody with more energy. And one of the things that I like to track, not like on spreadsheets or anything, is how much energy do I get back from an activity? So you have return on investment, you have return on time. For me, it's return on energy is the most valuable commodity for me, even more than time, because I just want to enjoy the time that I have on this earth. And when I work with motivated people, I'm having a lot more fun than when I'm having to push somebody uphill. So that's that's one of the biggest reasons that I started doing partnerships. And now that I've done them, it's hard to ever imagine doing anything else. And so that that, that is uh, something that really is food for thought because you hit the nail on the head. In a previous business I had, when I would get a really stellar employee, they were going to end up being my competitor. And so you have to decide, do you want the level down employee or are you okay with knowing that you're going to lose this employee and they're probably going to take some business with them because they're going to be in the same industry. So that was always a tough one for me, but I love your partner idea because I know that you all, it's helped you all to grow. It's helped you to be in different markets. Um, now people might be wondering what is the structure of this? What does it look like? Are you, do you have a formal partnership? Do you have uh, an LLC? What what does that all look like if, in case somebody's wondering? Yeah, there's so many ways you could structure it. And so none of this, of course, is legal advice, um, but just more general thoughts mm -hmm. that you could take to an attorney if you end up drafting something. There's partnerships where we call them partnerships, but by legal definition, they're not. Mm -hmm. So like in real estate, the, like as an agent, the great thing is that you can use referral agreements in essence as partnership. And mm -hmm. so- I have a, a guy that we have a business together. Now we have formalized an LLC and an operating agreement. But before that, it was very simple. It was, we work together in this capacity. And when this happens, we have referral agreements in place to make sure we're both compensated. And because we were both licensed agents, that was super simple. And that was our way where we could have our separate businesses, but we could, on a certain deal, we can come together. And then after one deal, it became two, and then two became 50, and 50 became 100. And then we we're like, hey, all right, we've been dating for long enough. Let's go ahead and get married, <laughs> put an LLC together. So there's that way. 
which I love. Real estate affords that flexibility. And so there's there's just simple agreements. There's LLCs. There's there's all kinds of ways to structure. And the ones that I love the most are the ones that they don't stop me from doing the other businesses that I have. And they don't even lock me in 100% to doing all of that business with that person. So for example, maybe you're just partnering on a specific geographic area. We will do mm -hmm. these types of deals in this area together. Mm -hmm. but I can do those types of deals on my own in another state or those okay. types of things. So that way it's, it's, it almost serves as a dating type of, of scenario where you're building confidence in each other. And if something goes wrong, the stakes are pretty low. And then as the relationships continues to prove itself, that they're going to be a hard worker capable of handling things, then, then the, the business will grow, the relationship will grow, and then it could become something more formal. I, I love that. We've been dating long enough, so let's get married. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that is so cool. And I, I thought you were probably going to say that it depends how you structure the partnership, but I love the way you've laid it out. And for folks that might be thinking about this, if you want to work virtually in another area, find a partner. Don't don't try to train a staff or or get a group or whatever. You know, get some people get an agent who may or may not be good. Find somebody that's already successful and work it out so that it's mutually beneficial for both of you, whatever that looks like. But we're all back to psychology here. So picking someone that's good at what they do is so fundamentally important and not just like could be good, but actually is good, has proven results. So I would say in a partnership, one of the things that works is when both people are complementary and proven in, in their existing skill. Mm -hmm. Like what I did in the past, which did not work was I could be good at this thing and you could be good at that thing. And then therefore, when we get there, it'll be perfect. Mm -hmm. But inevitably one of the two people, if not both don't get there. And so if you don't have a skill that you're very, very good at to bring to a partnership, go get one of those first, go work under somebody, go do whatever it takes to become very, very good. And then demand in your partnership that you find somebody that is equally good and already proven in that space. That's a recipe for success. But if you're both not proven, don't do it. I love that. So that gives people guidelines. And I think to your point, that is one reason why so many partnerships don't, they fail. The, the people are not, like you said, um, they're not at the same level. Um, they, they're lacking skills. And I think they lack communication too. I think that's a big thing. Like you said, we think we'll, we'll, we think we'll both get there. And when we get there, we'll be good. I think there's a lot of that going on in, in partnerships. Usually started by friendships, which, which is the worst of all, because then, then there's all kinds of negative feelings that come in. Yeah. Um, I love that. So do you have some final Final tips here. What if someone, we've covered a lot of ground here, but what is some final advice that you have for people that um, one, they want to scale their business. Maybe they're, maybe they want to partner, maybe they don't want to partner, but they know that they need to get better at sales. Where do they, where do they start with this process? I'm, I'm talking about the person who's discombobulated. They know they've got a problem. We all know those people. We've all been those people, right? Um, how do you, how do you start to pull this, this together? It's a great question. So I'm a big advocate of who, not how. So there's a book out um, that's, that's fantastic. And so I think the first thing that I would do is do a deep dive into myself and determine if sales or whatever Avenue is, is my path. And if it is great, if it's not, then go, go find a salesperson. Mm -hmm. And so um, there's a saying that floats around, the accountability group that I have a lot, which is essentially this, and it, I'm sure it was in a book or a quote, but basically the idea is who's going to ride farther on a bike, the person who's training for a marathon or the person who loves riding a bike. Mm -hmm. And of course it's the person who loves riding the bike. So I'm not a huge proponent of people doing things that they can't fall in love with because mm -hmm. even, even if they become good, they're, they're not doing something that they love. And so for me, I was able to fall in love with sales because I fell in love with the, the increased knowledge of psychology I got from every sales interaction not from the activity itself. And so therefore I fell in love with sales. And so I would say, number one, do a deep dive and find out like, what is it that lights your fire? And, or like, even like what's something within that, that does for me, it was again, that psychology piece. If it's not sales, you know, sales is necessary for business. So therefore you have to connect partner or do something with a salesperson, but use 
use your strategic gift. So mine is sales. Tim is more in the marketing space. And so like, and not even like, you know, like brand marketing, but just more like guerrilla, you know, uh, strategic marketing. And so that's where we, we were able to connect is finding both of us were in, in doing strategies that built business differently. And so that's, that's where the connection was. So find your core strength and then go hundred percent and then connect with people who have complementary strengths. Yeah. You two are very complimentary. I will say that you, you, it just, it kind of exudes from you when you're together. Yeah. It's fun. And he's actually yeah. here now. So we're building some additional sets in these other rooms. And uh, so he's, he's working on that project right now. So as oh, soon as we good. hop off, we'll, we'll go shoot the breeze. Yeah. So. Awesome. So Matt, as always, I knew this was going to be a great show. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you. Uh, what's the best way for folks to get in touch with you? Yeah. So we have a link tree. If I haven't sent it to you already, I'll send it to you and that will help guide them. So if they want to listen to the podcast or join our free Facebook group or hop on a coaching call with Tim or I, um, we're happy to get them pointed in the right direction. Yes. And I'll be sure and uh, put those links that, you know, it's the freedom chasers podcast. If you just want to go hang out and listen to the podcast, they, they have a great uh, show where they co-host on the show. So they're always a lot of fun to hang out with. Um, but thanks again, Matt. And thanks again to all the listeners. And I will put those links there so that you can, um, find all the places, uh, all the resources that they have. So thanks to the listeners for coming out week after week. I really do appreciate it. And if you would, I know you love this show, please share it and get, leave us a rating and a review over on iTunes. And in the meantime, I will see you same time, same place next week. Bye for now. 